Acts chapter 6, starting at verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our, give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So, the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I suspect many of us here uh, at some time in our lives perhaps have had the really, I would say, amazing experience of being a part of of a team of people who were very unified in a common mission. A, a group of people working together, maybe a committee or some group of some sort, and you were on that group, and everybody had the same purpose, and they were all on mission for that purpose. I, I don't know if you've ever been a part of that. It's an amazing experience to, to go through something like that. Maybe you were in high school or college and you played sports, and you happen to be on one of those teams, great coach, everyone on the team was all in, everyone was working hard, and, uh, and, and you know, there were no prima donnas, it was all about getting to state championships, and everyone was focused on that goal, and everyone was working toward the same goal. I don't know, and if you've ever been on a team like that, it's really incredible. You remember that experience your whole life fondly. Um, or maybe you've been in a business at some time, and you know, every business has a mission statement, Right? but often it's just words on a piece of paper. But, but maybe you were actually in a business where your team or your whole business or whatever really were all into the mission. Everyone was going in the same direction. Everyone was working that way. And you know, when you're in a, a business like that or a company, it's exciting to go to work. Like you, you, you know, it's work is work, but you're like, yeah, but, but I love these people and we're all pulling together. And it's really energizing. Or maybe you were in the military at some point and you're part of a platoon or a, a, a crew on a ship that was all working like a well-oiled machine, or, or I don't know, this is kind of a silly example, but for any of you kids here, like maybe you play video games, and you played a multiplayer game, and, and you and the other players you play with frequently, you know, you guys are a well-oiled machine, and you're playing, you know, Halo or Battlefield or whatever, and, and you just love, you know, working as a team to, to meet goals, and you know, it's kind of a silly example, but it's a great feeling to work with other people and accomplish things. It's like the Patriots when they run out at the beginning of the game, you know, they, they don't get named one by one. They all run out as a big mob. They're all one big team. They're all working for the same goal. Well, sadly, though maybe some of us have experienced that, my guess is that all of us, or probably close to all of us, have experienced the opposite. You've been a part of a team that didn't have a common mission, that wasn't united. What's that like? Now, it's discouraging. People are divided. There's different little camps and factions. There isn't much trust among the people. It's inefficient. There's bureaucracy. If you want to get something done, you've got to play politics to try to get the simplest things done. And everyone's question is always, you know, what's in it for me? Not, not what's the, the main goal and what's the purpose here that we're all aiming for. Um, so it's, uh, it's a discouraging thing to be in a situation like that. You know, it's like you don't want to go work with a team like that. You don't want to be a part of it. And everyone's just kind of biding their time and trying to get through the day, but without any sense of cohesion and, and teamwork and spirit. Have you ever been a part of a church that had lost its sense of mission? That's also discouraging, you know? That can be a real bummer. You know, what's that church like? Well, same thing, you know? Just factions, divisions, everyone's griping about something or somebody, you know? 
the pastor's discouraged and he wants to quit. There's a large group of people that wishes he would quit, and they're working to help that happen more efficiently. You know, it's just, it's a bummer. But, but you know, in a church like that, all the energy, it, it's like cancer tumors. It, it's just sucking all the nutrients into, into that. And so there is an energy in the church for the mission, you know, for, for the, what the church is supposed to be doing. And what is the mission of the church anyway? Well, actually, that's something Jesus tells us. We don't even have to figure that out. He tells us very plainly in his word what the church's mission is. Uh, look at Acts chapter 1. We'll come back to Acts chapter 6 in one second here. But look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Here's the mission of the church. One statement of it by Jesus. These are his last words before ascending to heaven. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So this is a God-empowered mission. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The, the mission of the church is to be a witness to Jesus Christ, both in word and deed. The, the church is supposed to be pointing people to Jesus. We're, we're supposed to take this message that God has sent a Savior that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried. On the third day, he rose again. And now anyone, anyone, anyone who will repent of their sins and believe in him can be forgiven and reconciled to God and have a new life with God. It's open to all people. It's amazing. And so our mission is to take that gospel out into the world. That's the church's task. Or to, to say it another way, uh, Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 28. He said, go and what? Make disciples of all nations. Same idea, just different words. That, that the church has this mission to go out, to tell people about Jesus. And as people come to faith in Jesus, we're to make disciples and then teach them and build them up in the faith and help them become more and more like Jesus. So that's our mission. We don't have to re-engineer that. Jesus has given it to us. Well, the church in Acts, here in Acts chapter 6, was a church on mission. They, they were a church that was about this task. But as we're going to see, as we already saw as we read this passage, some problems kind of cropped up. The, in some ways, the success of the mission was causing some other challenges that actually started to threaten the mission if they aren't handled properly. So sometimes there's growing pains when things are going well. There's the problem of success. And this success was creating a situation where if not dealt with in a wise way, could actually hurt the very mission that caused the situation. So look at Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. So there it is. They're on mission. It's working. The number of disciples is increasing. It's, it's happening the way it's supposed to happen. But that created a problem. Actually, there were two problems. There's a, what, what I might call a primary problem in verse 1, and then that primary problem was through a kind of chain reaction causing a secondary problem in verse 2. So there's the primary problem creating the secondary problem, and both of these problems are threatening to, to sabotage the very mission that, that brought them to this point. So what were the problems? Well, the first problem was a problem of what we might just call disunity or division. There, there were people, there were stress fractures in the church, and there were division between two groups. Look at verse 1. It says, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the church was feeding widows in the church, which is awesome. They were on mission. It's great. They, they were doing what they're supposed to be doing. People were becoming disciples, and, and they weren't just kind of nominal Christians. They were taking their faith seriously, and there were widows in the church, and, uh, and they were feeding them. You, you know, to be a, a considered a widow, the New Testament actually has a lot to say about this, but, you know, you had to be elderly, you had to have no spouse, and then no relatives to help support you. So we're talking about elderly women without a husband, without sons, without grandsons, without an extended family to support them. What are they supposed to do, especially in those days, in an agrarian kind of setting where, where sustenance and living had a lot to do with physical strength and activity? 
And so the church was, it was awesome. The church was feeding these women. They were taking care of them and giving them what they needed. And, and so that's great. They were on mission. But there was this problem. There were two different groups in the church. There were, it says, Grecian Jews and Hebraic Jews. So, so the Jewish people at that time could have been categorized in two different groups. There are the Hebraic Jews. They, they, were, uh, they spoke Aramaic, Hebrew. They uh, were, were probably more based in Jerusalem. They, they were more traditionally Jewish, right? And then you have the Grecian Jews or the Hellen, uh, Hellenistic Jews. They were Jewish people who sp- more spoke Greek, and, and they had a more kind of open posture toward the broader Greco-Roman culture. So this was a challenge. You know, here's the Jewish people. They're a minority, and they live within this monstrous thing called the Greco-Roman society. How are, they gonna, how are you going to relate to that? And so you had some who were like, hmm, keep our distance more, and you had others who were like, well, let's, let's make some adoptions. So kind of like you had conservative Jews and liberal Jews. <laughs> you had the cultural conservatives, and you had the progressives. And as you can imagine, just like today, those two groups often don't get along. And so now here they are in the same church, and, uh, and it's great, right? The gospel's working. The mission is on. Lots of different types of people are coming into the church. Hebraic Jews are coming in. Greek Jews are coming in. And so, uh, you know, whenever the church is on mission, whenever the church is being faithful to the gospel, one of the things that almost always happens is you get a growing diversity in the church. It's just natural. You know, the, the, the diversity that exists in a particular community, groups that normally don't associate with each other, when the gospel is being faithfully proclaimed by the congregation and by people, what happens is people from those different groups that don't normally associate start coming together. Because the thing is, the message of the cross and Jesus is for everybody. It's not for any one particular cultural group. It's for anyone who will come. Uh, we're all on level ground at the foot of the cross. And so different kinds of people find themselves unified in Jesus. So so whenever the gospel's going out faithfully, whenever the church is on mission, you should expect to see Greek Jews and Hebrew Jews sitting together in worship. You should expect to see rich and poor. It, It shouldn't be surprising that different ethnicities begin blending together, that single and married start coming together, that liberals and conservatives start sitting together. That, uh, you know, Yankees fans and Red Sox fans are, you know, living in peace and harmony to some degree, you know, if there are any Yankees fans in the community, which probably is not the case. You know, deer hunters and vegans living in harmony, it's amazing. <laughs> and all these people are, are, are together. So, so the gospel is going out and, and the, the boundaries that exist between societies, because we always have to draw lines between us and other people, the gospel obliterates them, and these people come together. And that's great. Again, the message is working. The, the, the mission is on track. But then that creates a problem. You know, yay, different types of people together. Oh, now we have to live together. Oh, now we have to make this work. How's this going to work? We have different values and different assumptions about all kinds of things. It's, it's a challenge. The church is like a big blended family. You know, we've all been adopted by faith into God's family, but I don't know if you've had an experience with blended families. I don't know if you've been a part of a blended family. You know it is no cakewalk. It's really hard blending a family. Even the best case scenarios are difficult. Uh, there's tensions, the other, you know, spouse's kids, you know, they don't respect you, and all this stuff happens, and it gets really complex. People, the Brady Bunch really is just on TV, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's a lovely story, but... It, it's not real life. And so here's the church. All these different types of people coming together in Jesus, but now they have to actually be a community and work together. And so there's, there's tension and, and things are, are happening that aren't good and people are being overlooked. And so you have what? A complaint. That's the problem. The Grecian Jews are saying, hey, the system isn't set up so that we have a voice. We're not being taken care of. The Hebraic Jews are kind of the majority in Jerusalem, and we're sort of a minority, and people are overlooking our needs. And so this is a problem. This is threatening the mission. It's threatening the mission because, well, the gospel is supposed to bring reconciliation, not disunity. So here are these Christians out in the community, you know, preaching this message of reconciliation, and then the community is going, uh, but look at your church. People there are totally fighting. 
What kind of message of reconciliation is that? So, so the message of the gospel is being threatened by being undercut by disunity in the church. Disunity takes away the credibility of the message of Jesus. But then that leads to a secondary problem that also threatens the mission of the church. Look at the secondary problem. It's in verse 2. So the 12, that's the 12, the 12 apostles, they gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So the secondary problem is, is that now that the people whom God has appointed to kind of be the tip of the spear for gospel proclamation, they're not the only ones who are preaching the gospel, but they're the tip of the spear, they're the kind of setting the, the pace. Instead of those guys being out there with the gospel, they're now having their energies diverted to another important ministry, which is the care of widows. And, and make sure you understand the tone of verse 2 when they say it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word in order to wait on tables. It, it's not a dismissive negative tone. They're not, you know, the, the uh, apostles aren't saying, oh, brother, I'm just waiting on tables. Ugh, that's so beneath us. It's not like that. It, the, the, uh, the language there, the Greek, refers to the waiting on tables as the ministry of tables. So, so they, it, they saw it as a ministry. And up to this point, the apostles had been in charge of that ministry. People would come, they'd put money at the apostles' feet, the apostles would take the money, and they would distribute it to the needy in the church. But what's happened now is that the, the ministry has gotten so big that for that to be done well, the apostles are going to have to start taking too much time from preaching. So, so it's not that the apostles are kind of dissing the ministry of of caring for widows. It's just that they're saying, look, there's just not enough time. It's not right for us. We're we're called to one thing primarily. We've got another problem over here. We don't have enough time and energy. There's more work to be done than we can do. That's the problem. So what are they going to do? There's a problem of division that's leading to a problem of distraction. And both of these things are threatening the very mission of the gospel itself through the disunity and through the apostles who are supposed to be beating the drum for the gospel and they're instead caught up in a mercy ministry that's taking their time away from their primary calling. You see the problem? And so they come up with a solution, the solution in verses 3 and 4. And the solution is we need more hands on deck. Right? A bigger need requires more ministers. A larger flock demands more shepherds. Uh, greater, a, a greater task requires more hands. It's, it's just kind of simple. We need help. And so the 12 propose the addition of seven. Look at verse 3. Brothers, Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So this is, this is the get well plan for getting the church back focused on mission. He says, you know, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. I, I just have to point this out as a Baptist. I can't not point this out. The congregationalism in this verse you know, hey, you guys choose for yourselves seven people. So th- there's a congregational dimension to the fix that's taking place here. Well, we're going to come up with an idea, but you guys have to be involved as a congregation in, in coming up with a solution. You choose seven men. And who are they supposed to choose? Just anyone? No, no, no. People who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We want you to choose godly people. Spirit-filled people, people who are really living like disciples. You see, anyone who who leads or serves in the church needs to be a a maturing, godly disciple of Jesus. You know, that's not just for elders and pastors and missionaries. Like everybody, if you're a deacon, if you're leading a ministry, if you're in charge of a committee— if you're uh, teaching a Bible study in your home, if you're a Sunday school teacher for little kids, if you're in charge of, of the nursery or in charge of the sound team or whatever, if you have some role of leadership in the church, if you're in charge of finances and budgets, one of the primary requirements for anyone serving in the church is they have to be a disciple of Jesus who's really on mission themselves and is really seeking the Lord. 
you know, you can't, you can't say like, well, that, that job isn't that big of a deal, so we'll just, you know, get any warm body to fill that job. <sighs> you know, it just takes one or two people in a church, you know this, who get their eyes off Jesus and get worldly ways of doing things to cause all kinds of difficulty and distraction in a church. It just takes one or two people. I could, I could be that person. Anyone could. If I just got my eyes off Jesus, I mean, I, I could cause all kinds of havoc just by being a selfish the selfish person that I would be without the Holy Spirit. And so we all, we're all prone to this, and that's why it's important. Character matters. Godliness matters. We need godly people in these roles. It doesn't matter what the role is. And so this is really important because, you see, people who are walking with the Lord are on mission. If the mission of the church is to make disciples, but the leaders in the church aren't themselves practicing and progressing in discipleship, there's a problem, and it's going to catch up to itself eventually. And so part of being on mission as a church is, is not just what official leaders do, but it's every single part of a church, every one of us saying, I need to be walking with Jesus. I need to be continually fighting sin. I need to be praying. I need to be seeking the Lord. The whole, the whole church needs to do this. A church on mission is one where every member of the church is saying, whether I have an official job in the church or not, I am seeking the Lord. And when that happens, the church will be on mission whether someone is in an official job or not. It, it's the way it, it works out. Imagine this. We'll do a thought experiment. Imagine this. We've been praying for revival. Lord, send a revival, right? What if God said, yes? What if he sent a revival? And I don't know, let's just imagine, like let's say 500 or 1,000 people came into this church who were all brand new baby Christians because God's word did something amazing like he's done, like he has historically done at different times in church history. What if that happened? We'd be like, yay! But then what? You now have a thousand new baby Christians. You know, babies are really a lot of work. Pastor Godwin just had a baby. I see the bags under his eyes when he comes to work. <laughs> he uses makeup to try to hide it, but I notice. <laughs> I remember what it was like to have babies. It's exhausting. Babies are just, you know, people become Christians and we're like, yay, they become a Christian. But now you've, you know, they're a mess. We're all a mess. But, you know, when, I first, when someone first comes to Jesus, it's not like all their problems go away and they're fine. They're, they're often, like, coming out of all kinds of brokenness and dysfunction and, and addictions and all kinds, you know, webs of dysfunction in their family. And they're, like, you know, cl- grabbing on to the church and the gospel for dear life, and they're saved. But it takes a lot of work. Even those of us who've been following Jesus for 20, 30 years, we're still kind of a mess, you know? And so... Having a revival and having people saved is great, but then what? So now, okay, so continue the thought experiment. Let's say this happens. So I, I call you up, and I'm desperate. I'm like, oh, look, there's, there's like 20 people near you in Cohasset. There's like 15 people near you in your end of Abington who, who've come to faith. Listen, I need you to start a Bible study in your home next week. To, someone's got to teach these people. All right, you're it. Tag. You know, you've, you've been recruited. I've, I've uh, you know, conscripted you. You don't have a choice. God bless you, your pastor. And, you know, <laughs> what would you say? Would you be like, okay, this is kind of scary, but I know the Lord's with me. I've been walking with the Lord. I can do this. Or would you freak out because you're like, I'm a mess, and I haven't been walking with Jesus, and I sit in church, and people think I'm a Christian, but I'm not growing in discipleship. In other words, are you ready for whatever God may have for you? I don't know what the Lord's going to have for you. You should ask the Lord, Lord, give me a task. And it may be something official in the church. It may be something informal. Let's not get hung up on that. But let's all be ready and on mission. And so here's some people who are ready. They're, full of, they're known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. And they're in charge of this task. Because it's not just putting food on tables. It's forwarding the mission and it's It's fostering unity in the church. People, unity is such a precious commodity. And it's so fragile. 
You have to fight for unity in the church. You, you have to protect it. It's, a, a pre, it's like a Christmas ornament. It can get crushed so easily. It needs to be treated with such care. And that's all of our responsibility to protect unity in the church. Not that we can't raise questions or, you know, there's a problem right here, right? I mean, there's problems that come in the church. Yet we're all striving for unity. And that's, that's a, a tough work. And it, it's important. And then... If that happens, if unity is starting to be restored because these needs are being taken care of, verse 4, that will also help them solve the secondary problem. Verse 4, we'll give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. We'll, we'll keep the main thing, our main thing that God's given us to do, and you keep that main thing the main thing, and then the whole thing will work and the mission will continue. It's interesting that, that you see these two roles continuing on in the church so, so the church eventually is going to spread. It's going to go into the Roman world. There's going to be lots of churches planted. There's not just going to be one church in Jerusalem. There's going to be lots of churches. What's interesting is in these churches that get planted out into the Roman Empire, uh, the apostles obviously aren't leading every church. So who, who do the apostles give responsibility to in each of the churches? They give them to elders. So elders take on the teaching role in the churches. Now, you don't find the seven in the other churches, but you do eventually find an analogous role of taking care of needs in the churches. Who, who, who does that in the churches? Deacons. That's what deacons are called. The word deacon means to serve. It just means service. So, so s- these two roles get kind of mirrored. I, I don't know if there's a direct relationship of evolution from the seven to deacons, but eventually you do find these roles where there's people in the church who've been tasked to to be at the tip of the spear preaching the word of God, even though more than just the elders do that. And then you have people who, who meet specific needs and they're set up by the church. And so in our church, we have elders and, and their primary job is to lead spiritually and to shepherd and to preach and teach. And we have deacons and deacons, they take care of the needs of widows. They, take, they distribute funds to help people in need. We have a deacon team. But you know, we have lots of people in the church serving. You know, we have people on the finance committee who are taking care of budgets. I would argue they're deacons, even though we don't call them deacons, but they're doing the administrative work. I, in fact, I think we should change our church constitution and call them deacons, because it's what they are. They're deacons. They're serving a need in the church so that the whole mission can go forward. Our missions committee, they're deacons. They're, they're, they're dealing with some of the support, administrative things, so that our missionaries can go out there and preach the word. Our building crew, our head of our sound team, our head ushers, they're deacons, They're they're serving needs in the church so that the whole mission can go forward. And and so when that's happening, when there's unity and needs are being met, and and those who are are called to preach are preaching and the whole thing is moving forward, well, the mission is then helped. Anyway, people like the idea. Verse 5, this proposal pleased the whole group. Another point of congregationalism here, I might add. Somehow the, the whole group liked this. I don't know if they voted. The Baptist in me likes to think they voted, but maybe they didn't vote. I don't know. Maybe there was just a lot of head nodding and smiling. I mean, who knows? But something happened where the, everyone kind of knew that everyone thought this was a good idea, and it was somehow affirmed. And so they, they appointed some people. You got Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, these seven guys are put forward. The apostles pray for them. Let me say a few words about these seven guys. First thing that's notable, and many people have made this observation, those seven names, you can take a guess here, are those names Hebraic or are they Greek? They're all Greek. Kind of interesting, isn't it? I don't know if all of them were Hellenistic Jews, but certainly some of them seems like they would have been. I mean, they have these Greek names. Isn't it interesting that there's this problem between Hebraic Jews and Greek Jews? The gospel has now spread beyond the Hebraic Jews to include the Greek Jews. And so they have this problem, and the Greek Jews feel left out. So they actually put probably some, if not all, Greek Jews in charge of the problem. It's it's interesting, isn't it? So again, it's a very missional outlook. We're we're taking the gospel beyond the Hebraic Jews. The, The Hellenistic Jews are now coming into the faith. All right, let's bring them to the table of leadership. And so that even, even who they're picking and who they're bringing forward is very progressively missionally minded uh, where the church is heading. I was talking to a pastor recently 
um, about multiculturalism in the church, and this pastor had been a part of some multicultural churches. And I say, you know, I haven't really had that experience. I said, you know, what's the, what's the secret? Like, how do, you, how do you lead a church that's become multicultural in a way that, so that the church actually is multicultural if that's the community and the setting you're in? And, and this pastor said, you know, the most important thing is that the different cultures have to have a seat at the table of leadership, and they have to have a voice. And it can't just be symbolic. They, they need to all be a part of the conversation. And he says that the churches I've seen that have been successful multiculturally are ones where the leadership is reflecting the multiculturalism that is present in the church. And so and, and when that happens, well, then there's, there's room and there's conversation. And, and that's not an easy task because culture is such an insidious thing that we don't even realize our cultural values and so to become conscious of that and talk through that takes a lot of work and a lot of love. But that's what they're doing here. The seven, ten look like they're Greek Jews, and the twelve are more Hebraic Jews. And so something is happening. There's a progression that's taking place. That's, the, the progression of the gospel is now being reflected in the structure and the leadership of the church. The other thing I would note about these seven guys is that at least for two of them that we know of, they did a lot more than wait on tables. These guys were on mission. Look at the first guy, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. What do you know about Stephen? Well, the end of chapter 6 and all of chapter 7, which is a wicked long chapter that I've got to figure out how to preach next week. <laughs> that's, Stephen preached that sermon. I think Stephen preaches the longest sermon in Acts. So a guy who's not an official preacher preaches the longest gospel message. Isn't it interesting? And then he gets killed. He's the first martyr. And so Jesus is, is the first one to die for the gospel. He founds the gospel. And, and Stephen is the very first martyr for the gospel. He wasn't even one of the 12. I mean, did, did he know that was part of the job description? I mean, when he signed on to the seven, I don't know. But there it is. And so he was on mission. It wasn't just like, look, I can't talk about Jesus because I just do the the food, all right? I, I'm a food guy. I cook. Other people can take care of the, you know, the gospel stuff. I just, I serve behind the scenes. No, he's out there. What, what about chapter eight? Who's the hero of chapter eight? Philip is the hero of chapter eight. Philip takes the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch, who then takes the gospel into Egypt. You know, maybe that's, maybe that was the start of the Coptic church. You know? and, and, and what else does Philip do? He takes the gospel to the Samaritans. I mean, you, you think that the Grecian Jew, Hebrew Jew thing was kind of a big deal. That was nothing compared to Jews versus Samaritans. Those two groups didn't trust or like each other at all. And, and they battled over who were the true people and they had all kinds of ethnic and religious division. But Philip is the guy who crosses that boundary and he brings the gospel to the Samaritans and the Samaritans are coming to Jesus and it's after Philip has done the pioneering work that a couple of the 12 come and say, okay, this is good and they lay hands on it and kind of bless it. But it was Philip who's doing this. So my point is, these guys did a whole lot more than just waiting on tables. They were on mission. And it's a reminder that, that regardless of, of our job or our role in the church or lack of official role in the church, we're all called to be engaging with the gospel, every one of us. You, know? you don't have to be on an official committee or an official ministry of the church to be fully engaged in the mission of the church. Let me say that again. You don't have to be on an official committee or official ministry of the church to be fully engaged in the mission of the church. You just need a Bible, you need a heart, and you need the Holy Spirit, which you got. And you just start talking to people. You open your home. You, the, God's put people in your life, your family, your friends, and you just... You know, like God, when I was saying a couple weeks ago, you, you just be a little more bold. You say a little bit more than you say, would normally say. You speak a little bit more of the gospel. And God uses that. That's how the mission goes forward. It's through the whole church being engaged in on mission. So we can't tell ourselves, well, look, I'm, I just do coffee, okay? I'll, I'll help with the coffee at church, but I don't want to, you know, 
be out there engaging. Or, you know, I just do the budget, that's fine. Okay, I'm a deacon now, I'm a deacon of budget, whatever. But I don't do anything out there. And he can't, no, 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 we're all engaged. We're all on mission. One of my, uh, my hero, personal heroes in this regard, I don't want to embarrass Nancy Lundquist, so I won't mention her name, but she, um, she works on our staff. She's uh, our office manager, and Nancy is, she is an administrative beast, and I mean that in the most flattering way possible. I, I, the stuff she can get done and organized and crank through, I mean, it's, it's scary. She organizes things that don't need to be organized. Um, well, I didn't think so until she organizes them, and I'm like, oh, wow. And, you know, I'm very much not that way, so we really need each other. Uh, you know, I'm glad I have a, a personal relationship with Nancy in my life because I would be a mess. And she handles things and just takes things and figures things out, and she's like a soup, like uber deacon, right? But I'll tell you, that woman, when she's not at the church being an administrative workhorse, She is leading Bible studies with women and starting Bible studies in her home, and she's telling me about her neighbor she's trying to share the gospel with, and another person she's reading the Bible one-on-one with, and she's she's just doing gospel work, right? And it's really incredible. When we get together for staff prayer time, every week our staff prays for you and for the ministry of the church, pray for the members of the church, we pray for each other, and we go around the circle, you know, what, what can we pray for each other for? And, you know, when she asks for prayer, it's never like, oh, I just can't get this Excel spreadsheet to work. You know, it's nothing like that. It's always pray for this person I'm trying to talk to. Pray for my Bible study. Pray for the work of the gospel. That's where her heart and her mind are. And I just love that. And uh, it, it makes it a great place to work. You know, I love, I love working here. I, I'm on, this is one of those times in my life where I feel like I'm part of a team that's on mission in our church staff. And it's... It's just a really amazing experience to to want to come to work to be with these people because they're on mission. It's super cool. And so Nancy is is one of those people. And so, you know, just because you have an official role or because you have certain tendencies or you're more administrative or you're behind the scenes, we're all called in some way or another to be engaging with the gospel. And so that's what they did. And look what happened, verse 7. Look at the consequences. So, the word of God spread. Of course it did. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Of course they did, because where the word of God is present, the gospel is giving life, and we shouldn't be surprised that disciples are being made. That's how disciples are made and grown, through the word of God. And then even a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. That's really remarkable. You think of the priests. uh, The the priests would have been probably theologically insulated from Christianity because for them, you know, they're being told, hey, Jesus is the high priest, and he's the final sacrifice, and Jesus is the true temple. So that would have all been stuff that would have been contrary to their way of thinking. So the priests would have been people who would have been very insulated theologically from this. So, so I think what we have here is a statement not only of the expanse of the gospel quantitatively, but also the kind of qualitative penetration of the gospel into different sectors of, of uh, Jerusalem society, especially those sectors that you would probably say, well, those people probably won't come to Jesus because they're, they're kind of like that. You know? But here they are coming in large number because of God's grace and God's power flowing through a church that's unobstructed, flowing through a church that's well-ordered, flowing through a church that's on mission. And and as that church is on mission, it's like a clear conduit through which the Holy Spirit pours with great power and God does great things through his word. I'll tell you what, I read verse seven and I just think, oh, wouldn't it be awesome if that became part of the history of the South Shore of Boston that there was a certain period at the South Shore of Boston where the the annals recorded that the word of God spread and the number of disciples on the South Shore increased rapidly and a large, oh, we don't have priests, but I don't know, a large number of Unitarian pastors became obedient to the faith. People who theologically don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God suddenly proclaiming Jesus is the Son of God. I'm trying to think of an analogy. Maybe that's lame. Who knows? But wouldn't that be great? 
And God can do it. Our task is to be on mission. That's our job. Our job is to be people who personally are living a life of discipleship, who are living the Christian life consistently on our, on our own and in, together. And our task is to be engaged in the mission to whatever degree God gives us opportunities. And when God so chooses, God will move and do what God will do. Let me just say one more thing, and, and I'll finish with this, but just say a word to anyone here who's, who's here, and maybe you're not a part of this church, or maybe you're not really a, a Christian, you wouldn't call yourself that. I mean, you're kind of interesting, you're curious, you're here, but you wouldn't say, like, eh, not quite there yet. You know, I, I guess I would just, I, I realize that, you know, a lot of this sermon has been kind of an insider sermon, talking to Christians about the church, and, and maybe you found that interesting or educational, I don't know. But let me just say a word to you. Like, what's your mission? What is your life about? If, if you had to say what your mission statement was, like, what is it? Is it like, uh, get a good education so I get a good job so I can make money and then find the right spouse and then, you know, have kids and then get them into a good college so they can get a good education so they can make money. And then as I see that going on, then I'll eventually retire and then I'll enjoy some retirement and then I'll die. Is, is, that, is that the mission? Is, is that all? Is that, is that the purpose of life? Like what, why are we here? And what happens if after you die, there are things that are going to happen that are far more important than anything happened in this life, and you weren't ready for it at all? Because all you thought the mission was was, you know, retire well, like that game of life that we used to play as kids, that board game. Is, is that really the purpose of life? I want to tell you that God loves you and that he sent his son on a mission to save lost, confused people like us who have lost our way. And Jesus died for our sins. He died for our waywardness. And he rose again. And and through faith in him, we can not only be forgiven, but brought into the mission of God. You know, one of the the common things you hear from people who become Christians, at least I've heard over the years, one of the common phrases is, you know, before I knew Jesus, I didn't know what the purpose of my life was. I was just kind of doing what the world told me, and I, I just felt empty. I didn't know why I was doing it. But then when I came to know Jesus, my life was filled with mission and purpose and direction. And, and, and so one of the things the gospel does is it, it brings us into the mission of God so that we then become people who are participating in what God does, a mission that counts not just for this life, but for eternity. Would you open up your heart to the Lord? Would you open up your heart to Christ? What's keeping you from the Lord today? His arms are open. The gospel is for anyone who will repent and believe. Let me pray for you. Oh, Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would help us as a church to be on fire sold out, bought into the gospel. Lord, I pray for each of us individually as Christians that we would be disciples, living it in sincerity. I pray for all of us as a church that we'd be living it together. Lord, I pray that you would help us to order our church in ways that facilitate the gospel rather than hinder the gospel. Lord, help us be willing as a church to change and adapt and be flexible and fluid depending on what's needed in the different seasons in the history of, of what you're doing. Lord, help us to uh, be engaged with the gospel outside of the walls of this church. Help every person here have some avenue where we can be a little more bold with the message of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who, who doesn't know you. Oh, Lord, would you show them that you have a mission to save. And Lord, may they open their heart to you. May they stop living for the emptiness of this world. Oh, money is such an illusion. Success is so vapid. Oh God, would you cause us to see that these things are empty idols and that nothing fills the human heart like a relationship with the living God. Oh God, show this to us, all of us, we pray in Christ's name.